60 years ago, the first human flights to space changed our perspective forever. Looking back and seeing that our Earth was just a pale blue dot in a vast ocean of darkness, I do think it's a perspective that I wish more people had the opportunity to see. When you have an image of the Earth and you realize every single thing you've known, studied, heard, read, met, learned about is contained in that single image, it changes your worldview. It's the nature of human species. We're an exploratory creature since the Stone Age when we you know, sort of walked out of the cave and wondered what's over the next valley. We've always been explorers and we still always will be explorers. We're never going to be content to just sit on Earth. As one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Now we're on the brink of another giant leap for mankind. Essentially, our future as a humanity is inextricably tied to the way that we can continue to utilise space. I think what we'll see now in the new path to return to the moon is again that new technology, new services, new engineering that we really can't predict when we set out to try and build it, but really will make our lives unrecognisable. of entrepreneurs is looking to the stars. We're looking to have a multi-billion dollar valuation in the company. My vision of space is I think, you know, sooner or later there'll be, you know, millions of people living off the planet. There'll be, you know, cities on the moon, cities on Mars, and it'll just become a major part of the ecosystem. Everything is going to be space. In the 21st century, science fiction is becoming science fact faster than ever before. We're now on the cusp of a new industrial revolution that will change the way we live, the way we communicate, how we travel and how we work. Tonight on Four Corners, we examine the extraordinary opportunities and challenges of the new space age. It's not just a boom, it's a frenzy. Suddenly, every government department is a space department in one way or another. All industry sectors somehow are dabbling in space and not just the technology sectors. The legal sectors, uh, project management uh, sectors. Each university is suddenly a space university. It truly has become a frenzy. For decades, space was a battleground of superpower ambition. In 1957, the Soviet Union successfully launched Sputnik 1, the first human-made object to orbit the Earth. The space race became one of the defining themes of the Cold War. When we look to the Apollo era, NASA fell behind Russia. Russia was winning in lots of cases. So NASA said, let's just skip 10 steps and go here. Let's go to the moon. Let's skip all the stuff in between. Space has always had a powerful grip on the human imagination. The Apollo missions and the moon landings inspired a whole new generation. In 1969, Pam Melroy was one of the millions of kids who watched the moon landing. And at that moment, I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. Discovery's commander, Pam Melroy. Her ambition took her all the way to the top of the NASA space program. I flew in space three times, including my last flight, where I commanded a shuttle mission to the International Space Station. Houston Discovery on the big loop for both control teams. The overall feeling is how gorgeous the Earth is, and it's dynamic. It's rolling by underneath you. You get a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes, and you just can't believe you go completely around everything. 
everything that we know, every piece of music, every person you could meet, you go completely around it in 90 minutes. For more than 50 years, the race to the stars has been limited to nations with vast resources, until now. The cost is really plummeting because private companies are making it efficient. The things that used to be a billion and a half dollars are now a hundred million dollars. You know, prices are literally plummeting by a tenth the price, a hundredth of the price it used to be. And simply because it's cheaper, we can do it. And I like to point to India, for instance. Their mission costs, I think, just under a hundred million dollars, which is still really expensive. Do you copy? Yes, 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 I copy. I'm gonna tap. The movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney costs $120 million. It is now cheaper to go into space than make a movie about going into space. The old saying, right, was the way to make a small fortune in space was to start off with a big one. But actually now, uh, about a third of all space activity is commercial, right? You've got about a third military, a third civilian, like NASA, and a, and a third commercial. Um, so it's really big business. Arguably, few people have supercharged human space ambition and changed what is now possible more than Elon Musk. The billionaire founder of PayPal and Tesla has moved aggressively into space. He believes humans will be more than just space tourists. He has plans to settle people on Mars, and he says we will inevitably become a multi-planet species. Fundamentally, the future is vastly more exciting and interesting if we're a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species than if we're not. Uh, it, you want to be inspired by things. You want to wake up in the morning and think the future is going to be great. Um, and that's what, uh, what being a spacefaring civilization is all about. It's about believing in, in the future and, and thinking that the future will be better than the past. Um, and I can't think of anything more exciting than going out there and being among the stars. Elon's not the first billionaire to try and get into the space business from, uh, you know, dot-com money in the 90s or a lot of people who did that. He was just the only one so far who had the stamina to see rocket after rocket blow up and still not give up. And so, you know, it was a rough first few years, but he stuck with it until he had something that worked. And I think that's the distinguishing feature is that he has both the vision, but also, if you like, the guts to, to push forward uh, uh, and not give up when at the first hurdle. Elon Musk's big breakthrough came with the development of relatively cheap, reusable rockets. Look at that. That's unreal. Three, two, two years one. ago, Musk's Zero. company, SpaceX, successfully launched what it calls its Falcon Heavy rocket. The Falcon Heavy is a powerful, reusable rocket that can carry the world's biggest payloads into space. That was super stressful, but... It worked. Stand by for main engine cutoff. Elon Musk challenged the status quo on how we access space and said, no, it doesn't have to be done the way we have been doing it for years. We can make it cheaper. We can make it more available to anyone. And honestly, I think a lot of people really doubted that was ever going to happen. Um, and he proved them wrong. And so it's been, it's been this huge catalyst. The splashdown of the SpaceX Dragon manned flight this month was another game-changing moment in the history of space exploration. Splashdown. Welcome back to planet Earth, and thanks for flying SpaceX. It has a bigger significance, I think, that it's saying that low Earth orbit's no longer the frontier, that we can focus at NASA on further horizons like the moon and Mars. And for low Earth orbit, yeah, that's just a trucking company. SpaceX can do that. SpaceX and Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9 have not just changed human exploration, but space missions as well. It is literally hundreds of millions of dollars cheaper to launch it. NASA builds space telescopes, something I've worked on, and you don't launch on NASA rockets, you launch on SpaceX, because it is cheaper. And that means what used to be the cost of two missions is now four missions. And so once you can do four missions, the science and research accelerates, so now then you can go do eight. There's this multiplying factor that's happening.
Elon Musk's most ambitious rocket of all is this. It's called the Starship, a cheap steel tube that can carry a huge payload. This month it made a test flight to 150 metres before successfully coming back to Earth. Starship is the next generation rocket and it looks just like, you know, a, a 1950s science fiction rocket ship. If it works, it could be a further revolution in the cost of getting to orbit. Rapid reuse, very huge payloads going into space, being able to carry very large numbers of people into space. He needs this if he wants to settle Mars in the long run. And, uh, but you know, it's been a, a bit of a rocky road so far. He's blown up quite a few test articles. Having, making something really sexy. <laughs> Three, two, one, release, release, release. Fire. Fire. SpaceX isn't the only company developing cheaper space transport. Welcome to the club, astronaut. <laughs> Richard Branson has plans to develop commercial spacecraft for space tourism. We've been working on this lander for three years. And Amazon founder Jeff Bezos is also developing rockets to carry humans into space and spacecraft to deliver cargo to the moon. We have here as an example a very large rover. And by the way, even though that's a large rover, this vehicle can land four of them simultaneously on the surface of the moon. It isn't just SpaceX. There's other companies like Blue Origin coming online as well private companies and smaller groups in Australia or Rocket Labs in New Zealand, for instance, that is all making that cost cheaper. I like to think of it's like airplane travel. We spent the longest time having one costly airline, but now we have a bunch of budget carriers that are making it effective. We live on this little dot and what's out there is just massive and I want to explore what's out there and, and, and see it. Australian entrepreneur Adam Gilmore is building one of those budget carriers. Hey guys, we're going soon. Five years ago, he cashed in right, a lucrative right. career as an international banker for the potential he saw in space. This rocket engine sits up the top of the vehicle and it's the final engine that puts the satellites into space. So you're going to see a 20 second burn of this engine where we're making sure that the fuel's burning properly, the materials in the rocket engine are, are operating correctly. Um, and everything else is smooth. And then a burn duration of 20 seconds, purge delay two seconds. At a secret location near the Gold Coast, Nine, Four Corners eight, filmed Gilmore's seven, technicians six, in the final stages five, of testing a new hybrid rocket that he hopes will see his company become Australia's first multi-billion dollar launch company. There's a lot of things that will happen in the next five or ten years that will set the scene for the next ten or twenty afterwards. Well, I think we're going to expand out because we can. I think because we can get out of this Earth and there's so many planets and asteroids and everything just in the solar system, it is inevitable. It's the same reason why, you know, humans have colonised the Earth um, so, so greatly. I think we'll do it to space. If you have the access, then we'll do it. Like almost everyone in this business, Adam Gilmore has grand ambitions. But for the moment, he's working towards cashing in on the fastest growing area of one of the world's fastest growing industries. When are you going to start putting low grade hydrogen peroxide through it? The biggest thing that's been changing is miniaturisation technologies has been shrinking satellites. And what that's done is make it incredibly cheap to build a satellite and to launch a satellite. And that's why our rockets are good, because our rockets can take up very small satellites. Australia has a long connection to space missions. Ted Binbilla is just a small part of NASA's global space infrastructure. Everything from the pictures of Armstrong's first steps on the moon to communications with deep space probes and rovers on Mars have passed through here. The NASA Deep Space Tracking Station in Tibibillas, you know, just outside Canberra, is essentially the ears of space. And if we don't have that capability, we can't get the data back from Mars, we can't communicate with spacecraft. 
And the second problem we have in this is we're on this globe that spins. You can't just have one point on Earth that talks with everything in space. You need these things spread around the world. And Australia, because of that geographical position, we're in the middle between the US and Europe, and we're in the Southern Hemisphere, provides that other ears that you can't get on one side of the world. And NASA and Europe identified Australia you know, 50, 60 years ago as the place to do it. Australia also has some unique advantages in the space sector. Our geographical position, our wide open spaces and relatively low light pollution. But for all that, we have come to the new space rush a little late. It was only two years ago that we joined much of the rest of the developed world and established a national space agency. The Australian Space Agency here in Adelaide open. Why did it take so long? I think it was a lack of understanding by many, many people of what space is all about and the opportunities that it can present. So I think it took a little bit of time for people to understand the significance of space, the space industry, the space sector to Australia. There's opportunities for us to grow our businesses, there's opportunities for um, us to create jobs here, and there's opportunities in, in space for our everyday lives to become that much easier. Uh, that more and that much more simpler. So yes, there are some opportunities for us and we should grasp them with both hands. The Australian Space Agency was really important and a very positive step because what it does, it gives us a policy organisation within government whose job it is to help grow the Australian commercial space sector. Right now, the space world is a very exciting field to be in. Full of boffins who've spent years working toward the moment we're now living. Brad Tucker, an astrophysicist at the ANU's Mount Stromlo Observatory, is one of them. I love doing it. I love talking about it. I think people feel that. And I love talking about it because it is so now tangible. In the 90s, it wasn't tangible. You know, yeah, things happen, and there was things happening, and it was cool. All right, but, but that's it. But it, it feels so real now. It feels so accessible. When people like Brad Tucker talk about how space will change our lives in the near future, the big focus is on cheap global broadband that will drive even more rapid technological development. The real big market that's developing now is broadband internet from space. There's three or four companies that are launching thousands of satellites into low Earth orbit that are going to beam down broadband all over the Earth. And the speeds are you know, two to three times faster than the NBN. This is a big project that lots of companies are doing, OneWeb, uh, Starlink, Amazon. The fact that for a fraction of the cost of the MBN, we can get terabyte per second downloads, that transforms the way we work. And we're not talking about in cities. You can be in the middle of a rural town in Australia and have the same connection speed as a city and better than what we have right now. You know, you can only imagine that's gonna transform. The fact that we're gonna get GPS accurate to the scale of centimeters. We're not even talking about tens of meters. The scale of centimeters means, you know, the data freeze for farmers and tracking and navigation is an order of magnitude better. We're getting into the age where it's not just people that are being connected, it's machines. It's business to business, machine to machine, machine to person. And the implications for that are enormous. Who can say exactly what they are? What we'll see unfold in, in uh, the next small number of years uh, will probably be quite staggering. The actual deployment of the Bowtie antenna. At the University of New South Wales campus in Canberra, Russell Boyce and his team are working with Defence on research to develop small next generation satellites for potential intelligence gathering. If we can have a lot of these in orbit, they'll be able to bounce signals from one to the next to the next. Yeah, it's not just a boom, it's a frenzy. Australia has by far the fastest growing space sector in the world, the fastest rate of establishment of startups of any space economy anywhere in the world. 
In June, they launched the latest of their so-called CUBE satellites. Southern Ocean. We can fly these small space missions to demonstrate the art of the possible. That's what we're doing in collaboration with the Air Force. Uh, that's what we seek to do um, for, for government, uh, for industry partners. Our vision is to be a significant contributor to this development of networked, intelligent constellation capabilities. And every mission that we fly is a step towards that. Satellite technology is evolving fast, and Australian scientists are at the forefront of the new developments that will deliver a huge array of applications. And when you think about the first satellites and the size that they needed to be in order to be able to get these sorts of images of the Earth, now this is a, really a whole new world that we're in with these CubeSats, very small satellites, very miniaturised, and of course, you know, cheaper and quicker to get up. But it will let us look at things like ground cover across Australia, so for example, deforestation or flooding. Um, it will let us see through smoke and see what's happening in bushfires. Um, and it will let us look at how clouds are formed, for example, and see the creation of cyclones. With more and more countries now launching their own technology, low Earth orbit is fast becoming a very crowded space. There are still tens of thousands of satellites planned to go up in sort of like nets around the Earth, and they are a problem if they're not monitored. If they're in very low Earth orbit, sort of the two to 300 K, they will decay very quickly. And so their, their lifespan's only a year or two. So the chances of them actually causing any trouble is not very high. If you put too many in orbit, it is a challenge. That's a daily operational challenge for the world in operating the space technologies that we do depend upon. There is a growing area called space traffic management it's an activity being built upon uh, space situational awareness, led by the US, but Australia is a key player, as are many other uh, nations, in understanding what's going on up there, keeping track of it, predicting collisions, and trying to avoid it. If you think about the time from when Sputnik went up in 1957 to now, the world has probably launched, let's say, six to 7,000 objects into space. If you just take the well-publicised plans of one or two or three companies, we're talking about an additional, let's say, 80,000. We've had collisions in space. We've had near misses in space. Um, everything that's in space above about, let's say, five or 600 kilometres above mean sea level, it's travelling at you know, very, very fast speeds, depending on where they are, but maybe somewhere between seven to 15 kilometres a second. So even something the size of, a, of, of a, a small bolt will destroy anything it hits, of course, cascading into more debris. Accidents will happen, mistakes will happen. The more we grow in that dependency, the more those things will happen. We will have space disasters for tourists. We will have satellites colliding and triggering geopolitical tensions. That is just going to happen. So it's, it's the need for society, the need for people to, to make sure we, we put a check and balance on what that possibility is and have our policymakers and scientists think of those other things to make sure we can control it. Space analyst Malcolm Davis has been one of those focused on the potential benefits of space exploration. But he is also well aware of the potential dangers, including the militarisation of space. You are seeing a recognition now that space is contested. It's not this serene, peaceful sanctuary that sits untouched by terrestrial geopolitics. Instead, it's a warfighting domain where you have major powers like China and Russia developing counter space capabilities, anti satellite weapons designed to deny the US and its allies, including Australia, access to critical space support in a future conflict. The more dependent we become on satellite technology, the more vulnerable we are. An attack on our critical satellites could cause much of our society to grind to a halt. And then if we can't recover that effectively, you're in a sort of like a Mad Max world where everything falls apart uh, and our economy collapses. 
shock and awe as we saw in the Iraq invasion will not be what it was. You disable a country's satellite network, you disable a country. That's the simple fact. And you can then see how some of the superpowers, some of the other countries, you, you change a you change a policy, you change a government, all of a sudden you don't want to behave with your friends or your enemies, and you can isolate, you can block off a country from accessing the other technology in the world, and that's how you enclose them, and that's how you control them. And it, this is not just these dreamt up ideas. People are doing this already. Russell Boyce believes it's essential for Australia's security to be self-reliant in space. It's extremely important to have our own sovereign control of satellites. It's important, well, from national security reasons, uh, we need to be in control of the technologies that provide us the information that we need to keep Australia secure. Uh, but in a, a commercial sense as well. In July, the US Space Command announced that it had evidence Russia had tested a space-based anti-satellite weapon. It was clearly a weapons test. It was an anti-satellite weapon designed to hit and destroy a target satellite, one of ours. It wasn't tested against one of ours, but nevertheless, the message was sent that Russia is developing that capability. China has similar capabilities. And I think that we have to recognise that in a future war, either prior to a conflict or during a conflict, our satellites will be attacked. The potential for war in space is a real possibility. Both China and Russia have arms of their military dedicated to space. Last year, Donald Trump established the newest branch of the armed forces to deter aggression in and from space and to protect the interests of the US beyond the Earth. This is a very big and important moment. It's called the Space Force. Space. Going to be a lot of things happening in space. Because space is the world's newest warfighting domain. Amid grave threats to our national security, American superiority in space is absolutely vital. And we're leading, but we're not leading by enough, but very shortly we'll be leading by a lot. The Space Force will help us deter aggression and control the ultimate high ground we're going to have to uh, defend ourselves in space. The establishment of the new US Space Force came two years after Russia announced it had built a hypersonic missile. Unveiling the new Space Force flag in the Oval Office, Trump announced the US had something even bigger. We have, uh, I call it the super duper missile. And I heard the other night, 17 times faster than what they have right now. Then you take the fastest missile we have right now. Uh, you've heard Russia has five times, and China's working on five or six times. We have one 17 times, and uh, it's just gotten the go-ahead. 17 times faster, if you can believe that, uh, General. That's something, right? 17 times faster than what we have right now. Fastest in the world by a factor of almost three. So I just want to congratulate everybody and thank everybody. Uh, space is going to be, uh, it's going to be the future, both in terms of defense and offense and so many other things. And already, from what I'm hearing and based on reports, we're now the leader in space. It's only a matter of time before we start seeing real space conflicts. I think when people heard of Space Force, everyone thought it was a joke. People tend to forget President Obama asked Space Force to be started, but the Pentagon at the time said, we don't really need it. Even Reagan in the 80s flagged something like this. If you need space to critically operate on Earth, the advantage of operation on Earth is controlling space. It, it's pretty simple. The boundaries are less clear in space. You, you can clearly see when someone invades your country or someone launches an attack on your country. Those areas are very gray in space. the consequences of war in space would be truly mind-boggling. If we lose control of space, we lose the war and we lose it quickly. 
Chinese understand our dependency on space systems to fight, and so therefore they're going to target and have the ability to take out those critical space systems, the satellites and the ground links between the Earth and, and the satellites. If we see a full-scale war, we're talking about satellites being disabled. It's not missiles, it's not Star Wars, but we have lasers that disable things. That's just a technology we have. We have satellites that can steer and interfere. You can have kamikaze satellites. So what we'll see is the tampering, the disabling, the, the interfering with networks on the Earth, and then the conflicts that we have, not even around the Earth, but on the Moon, on asteroids, on Mars. Space piracy? a real thing that's going to happen. There are no rules around conflict in space. Space lawyer Stephen Freeland says space is still something of a legal black hole. A new arm of legal study has developed to try and deal with it. Clearly, the rules of war that we have, and I've mentioned Geneva Conventions, but there are lots of others, all of those were developed for terrestrial warfare, by and large. Space is a unique environment. The consequences, let's say, of blowing up a satellite in terms of the formation of debris are unique to space and would have long-lasting consequences. <laughs> so automatically, that alters the way that you might be asking the relevant questions that you ask on Earth about perhaps undertaking a military operation or, or striking something. It's not just nation states that could be attacking each other in this new military theatre. Cheaper access to space has also potentially opened up a new galaxy of opportunity for global disruption. The threat of galactic terrorism, for instance, is no longer science fiction. The benefit of everything being cheap is a lot more people can do it. The negative of everything being cheap is a lot more people can do it. And that regulation, that control, just isn't there because it was never envisioned to be there. A big concern of mine is what's known as soft kill counter space. Whereas rather than physically destroying a satellite and creating a huge cloud of space debris that you know, essentially denies space for everyone, you have technologies such as cyber attack on satellites that actually simply disable or damage or deny a satellite temporarily, but leave that satellite intact. So you could have non-state actors or even individuals hacking satellites and denying space to others. And I think that's a concern for the future. While the low Earth orbit satellite zone is quickly becoming a contested space, human ambition is pushing well beyond that to a new frontier. Coming up on 30 seconds in the flight, the RD-180 is throttling down as expected. Sending people to Mars is now humanity's next great leap forward. We're sending a lot of missions to Mars because we think it may hold signs of life. And, and that is a very important, I think, existential question. Are we alone in the universe? How did life form here on Earth? Mars may hold that key, and I think that's really cool. How did Mars change geologically, environmentally? What does that tell us for our Earth? That's a very important question. So there's a lot of rich science to explore in Mars. But then there's also that human conquest of, we want to send a human there, we want boots on the ground. But planting footprints on the red planet will require a staging post on the moon. The space industry is already looking at the rich lunar resources to fuel the onward trip to Mars. The problem with Mars is that it is a six-month trip one way, best case. So that's a long way to go when you really haven't tried to live on another planetary surface. So one of the enormous values of doing this on the moon, understanding how to extract resources, understanding how to live and do science on the surface of the moon, which is only a couple of days away instead of six months away. And the race to claim the moon is now well underway. We want to take people to the moon. We want to operate on the moon. This is like in the far future, but that's a long-term goal of ours. I think Mars is overrated. I think moon is where all the action's going to be. The new moon race, it's not a, a theoretical one. It's not a hypothetical one. It is one that lots of countries are doing. 
there's going to be a, a space race to the moon and I think it's going to be a bit of a land grab and it's going to keep happening for the next 10 to 20 years. I've seen what the Chinese want to do and they're very, very focused on going to the moon. Mining the moon is now seen as the next logical and inevitable step. We've just scratched the surface of the moon. I mean, 12 humans have stood on the moon. Just 12 humans out of all of human history. We've just begun to explore that. The potential to understand what's out there in terms of resources, to exploit those resources for the betterment of humanity, to journey out and dis discover new worlds. Not everywhere on the moon is equally valuable. And in particular, there's an area at the south pole of the moon that has frozen water embedded in the rocks at the poles. It is what's called the peaks of eternal light that are permanently illuminated by the sun. And then next to them are valleys of eternal darkness in the deep craters at the south pole. And they're sort of nice and cold and water can stay frozen. It's gonna be actually the equivalent in space of oil. In the moon, with the discovery of ice, water ice, that means we can use it for human settlements, we can use it for rocket fuel, lots of uses. The fact that it also may have other things like helium-3, which can be a good fusion source, means it's a good source of energy. So if you want to go to Mars, it's a lot quicker to leave the moon because it's less gravity, less atmosphere. It's a lot easier to leave and launch from that than it is the Earth. And then at the second time, if these things are rich in resources, you have now a new supply of fundamental natural resources that you're not dependent on another country to trade for. The new frontier is throwing up some old ethical dilemmas. Iron, titanium, platinum and nickel are just some of the other materials also abundant in space. Should we be mining in space? That's a very good question. I think it will be a natural evolution for humans to build habitats in space. This is a, a long way off, for sure, but it's certainly um, something that will happen. Should we be mining the moon? Absolutely. The potential resource wealth on the moon and in near-Earth asteroids is huge. And whilst there's legal and regulatory arrangements to try and manage that, there's no law against it. So it's a case of how we mine the moon and near-Earth asteroids and what we do with those resources. We haven't exactly treated this planet particularly well. Should we be going and doing similar sorts of destructive activities on other planets? Well, that's one of the questions that needs to um, to be asked. One of the issues that we do need to um, need to look at, particularly if we're looking at the the moon. So, if we just focused on the moon, it's going to be how do we actually protect and preserve um, the the moon whilst still looking at um, what we can obtain in terms of knowledge, what we can uh, obtain in terms of um, resources. And that's why it's important that we engage in those discussions now and that we are part of um, developing any ethical uh, framework for operations on the, the moon. This time, we will not only plant our flag and leave our footprint. Donald Trump is pushing to have Americans back on the moon by 2024 and setting up a lunar base by 2028. Many worlds beyond. But establishing a permanent human presence on the moon is not just a pressing priority for the United States. China was late for a superpower to the space game. It didn't take it very seriously until the 90s, and it's been catching up like crazy for the past couple of decades. They've now caught up. They're a full first-ranked player in the space race. In January last year, China successfully landed its Chang'e 4 lunar probe on the far side of the moon. The far side of the moon was important because it demonstrated, I think, even above what the Americans have done, that the Chinese are ambitious. The Americans have never landed a probe on the far side of the moon. For the Chinese, that was a world first. And I think it was an important signal to the rest of the world that the Chinese are serious about having a major space um, program and becoming what they call a comprehensive space power. I think it's fantastic that China has 
invested a huge amount of money uh, to go as fast as possible. And uh, they've got scientific experiments on the far side of the moon. It's very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, happy that they're, they're, they're pursuing that science. It, it does make uh, some people a little bit worried when you look at the South China Sea, whether it's a play for resources. Who gets to control space is one of the great challenges of the future. The fundamentals of space law were set out in the International Space Treaty in 1967. This was essentially agreed by the United States and the Soviet Union right in the early days of space technology, that space is not an area to be colonised. But the International Space Treaty has never really been put to the test. There's a whole debate now about the resources of space, so the minerals or the water that's on the moon, as an example, and there are others, as to what about claiming some sort of property rights to them. And that's a debate that's going on. You could have 10 lawyers in a room and you'd get 10 different opinions as to what the position is. There is a sense in the Outer Space Treaty that, you know, you have to share, but that hasn't really been tested in practice. And so I think there is going to be a bit of a land grab at the South Pole of the Moon, and it's going to be interesting uh, to see how that works out. Humanity does appear to be on the cusp of one of the great transformative moments of civilization. Like it or not, the race to space is unstoppable, and what seems challenging now will be routine in just a few years. I tell my kids, right, in a hundred years, people will look back and, and, and just think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with catching a rocket to the moon and back again. The same way my kids just get on a plane and think nothing of the technology of going anywhere, and as an engineer mind, I look at that technology as fantastic, but you take it for granted. In a hundred years, people will take going into space and to the moon for granted. It is inevitable. By the end of the 2020s, I'm pretty confident we'll have found life somewhere in the universe, in the solar system, and it, and it won't be, you know, aliens or Marvin the Martian, it'll be something simple. But the fact that we realize we're not alone, the fact that we may be starting to visit other planets in our solar system, we may be seeing other things in other solar systems. Certainly, the world has entered a new stage. In fact, in many ways, with the, the current pandemic, it's a totally new world and the opportunities afforded by space technology and being involved in this now are enormous and I think we'll look back in five years, 10 years, 20 years and what Australia will hopefully have done with this opportunity we'll be very, very proud of uh, and that the benefits will be enormous. This is a pivotal moment for us to be thoughtful about how do we want to do this safely and in the right way and in a way that reflects the best of humanity going forward because we can't go back and fix it.